privilege to be in the house of the Lord. Can you say amen to that? You may be seated. I, I need to explain to you something that God put on my heart. And um, I sort of need to walk through. Calvary, I believe it's, it's your time. That God's best is yours to embrace when Satan is at his worst. When things look the worst, it's doing the best of things in the worst of times. Amen. And I must confess up until yesterday, I had no idea I would share this. I had worked on a different thought for tonight, but I felt nudged in the Holy Ghost. And it's a story behind the book on prayer. And there's a verse of scripture in Habakkuk, revive thy work in the midst of the years. Another translation reads like this, Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. Repeat them in our day. In our time, make them known. My, my subject tonight is once again, Lord. Once again, God. You've moved in this nation before. Once again, God. This nation has seen massive upheavals of revival. Once again, Lord. I want to see that happen. I want to see it. Would you just say that with me? Once again, Lord. Once again, Lord. Once again, Lord. Oh, praise God. New York City, the big apple, that the city that never sleeps. New York City is a long way from Denver, but it's really not that far. I'm not sure when it began. Probably about 25 years ago. I began to make an annual pilgrimage of sorts to the Big Apple, New York City. I don't go for the lights. I don't go for the sounds of Times Square. Nor do I go for the hustle, the bustle of Fifth Avenue. I go to another place and I go for a different reason. Once in Manhattan, the journey really isn't very complex. I take a subway to the financial district, usually to the Fulton Street Station. I walk down Wall Street. Beneath the towering facades representing our nation's economic prowess, I pass through the financial district and I walk toward the South Street seaport. When the crowds begin to thin, I know I'm almost there and Dutch Street comes into view. Hear my footsteps slow and hear how many dozens of times. Here's our black ball being from Tech and York. third church built in Manhattan, I find a quiet place nearby to reflect, to pray, and to remember. You see, the Dutch Reformed Church was once towering over all of lower Manhattan, and from its heights, one could see for miles. In the year of 1857, from those lofty towers, one could have seen three sites in three successive months. In June of 1857, looking north from the church to City Hall, you would have seen riots, riots. Not mobs fighting police, but police fighting police. There is nothing new under the sun, folks. In July of 1857, if you'd look west from the tower of that church toward Five Points, you would have seen two rival gangs numbering nearly a 1,000 squaring off in a bloody fight, many dead, many more Injured, and if one would have looked east in August, there was absolute panic. For an insurance company had failed, and a financial collapse hit Wall Street, and fortunes were lost overnight, and half of Wall Street's brokered houses went bankrupt. Thousands of New Yorkers were out of jobs, and everything that could be shaken was shaken. And panic led to recession, and recession led to depression. And that depression would eventually extend through a great civil war. But I don't make that pilgrimage for what happened in June, July, or August of that year. I go for what happened in September of that year. The pastors and elders of the North Dutch Church knew their church was dying. Urban flight, people were leaving the church, racing from the city, getting out of Manhattan. And in desperation... The pastor hired an unemployed tailor by the name of Jeremiah Lamphere, and his mission was street evangelism. 
Lanfear thought, I will reach the people that work on Wall Street. He printed a simple handbill. I have one of them in my library. And he began to distribute them to the distressed people in the financial district. September 23 was a pivotal day. It was the first prayer meeting. Nobody was at the church when Jeremiah got there. Ten minutes passed, nobody came. Twenty minutes passed, nobody came. He was still there alone. At 1230, he heard someone coming up the stairs. One person entered another, and finally six were present in total. Nothing extraordinary happened that day. There was no great outpouring of the Spirit. But the next prayer meeting, 20 showed up. And in the next prayer meeting, 40 showed up. And within weeks, more than 3,000 were coming to noon prayer meeting. And within months, 10,000 were coming to noon prayer meeting. God's spirit began to fall in the area. Criminals in New York City started turning themselves in by the thousands. Passengers and crews on ships coming into New York Harbor felt the power of conviction and began to fall on the decks of those ships and cried out for repentance and in tears. Entire churches and organization came under the sway of God's moving power. Hundreds of such prayer meetings followed, not just in New York City, but across these United States. States. The 1857 prayer revival is not remembered much by secular historians, but it was probably the single greatest awakening ever experienced in this country. It sustained people of faith on the eve of a civil war and going through civil war. After the civil war, it continued. It ushered in the holiness movement and then the Pentecostal movement. New York is a long way away from Denver, but tonight I believe it's really not that far because if my people which are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face uh, folks I'm believing I'm believing that he did it then God hasn't changed he's not a respecter of persons uh, he can do it now he can do it here uh, and I'm praying once again Lord once again again, Lord. Uh, once, I wish somebody would shout that out right now. Once again, Lord. Once again, Lord. Once again, Lord. Uh, oh, I sense a Holy Ghost uh, in this building. Is there an unemployed tailor? Is there somebody you don't have a preacher's license? Uh, you don't have the pedigree uh, in this thing, uh, but you've got a desire uh, to bind together, uh, to lead one of these 20 prayer meetings, uh, to lead lead a prayer in your home uh, and say, I shall not stop uh, until Denver shakes uh, under the anointing uh, and the power uh, of the Holy Ghost. Uh, I say, let it be, Lord. Uh, I say, let it be and let it happen with me, God. Well, somebody praise him right now. Just reach out to him in faith. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm not describing something, folks, that has never happened before. We've got precedent. We can put our finger on a calendar and say, then and there, and why not here and now? We've got precedents. Star of diseases is what it's called in law, and it's pretty much the working principle of modern law. It's a Latin phrase meaning we stand by those things already decided. We more commonly call it precedent. That if something has happened before, that settles it. There is no question. We stand on those things already decided. We apostolics, we don't look to the past to see simply what once was. We look to the past to say it can happen again. And it can be better. Amen. Our motivation is not sentimentality or nostalgia. Uh, we're like that fallen soldier tossed uh, into the tomb of Elisha. If we can lay hold on those old bones, uh, if we can lay hold uh, on the miracles of the past, uh, it can happen again. Uh, it can happen in this moment. Uh, we stand on those things uh, decided. Uh, we declare precedent in this matter. 
was just prior to the modern rebirth of Pentecost, some people stopped believing in the miraculous. They said it doesn't happen. They said it happened back during the Bible days, but it doesn't happen now. They are formally called cessationists. Generally, they're a dismal bunch. They're a bunch of religious stick in the muds. Then there are the party animals. The ones who believe that miracles, signs, wonders, prophetic gifts, angelic visitations, those are called continuationists. Yeah, what a tug of war that is when the cessationists and the continuationists meet in service. What a tug of war. Some saying, no, he can't. Others saying, yes, he can. Yes, he can. Happens every church service. Happens every meeting. Happens every district meeting I've ever been in. Some arrive with a big no on their foreheads. Some arrive with a big yes, yes, yes. It happens in our hearts and mind. There's a voice saying, uh, I don't believe. Uh, I do believe. Uh, Lord, help my unbelief. Uh, can I remind you that Jesus is called the amen, the yea and amen, uh, that when we enter into his presence, uh, we should enter with a yes, uh, that there is a green light in heaven uh, saying it is God's will to do the miraculous. Uh, it is God's will to break every chain in this building. It is God's will because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'll read it in the girly translation. If he did it back then, he can do it again, and he can do it for you. Of the 3,779 verses in the four gospels, 729 of them deal with healings and deliverances. One-fifth of the gospels is devoted to Jesus healing people. Oh, my. Oh, my. I saw her last Sunday. I saw her last Sunday, one of the brand new members of our church. She's still wearing a wig, but she was helping baptize people. Uh, she was ushering them in. She was cheering them on and helping people get baptized and, and passing, uh, passing, being buried with him in baptism so they can rise and walk in newness of life. And she was cheering it. I couldn't help. I just burst into tears watching her because about a year ago, she came into our church without any hair on her head with her x-rays uh, saying I'm eat up with cancer I'm dying uh, you said that Jesus can heal me uh, will he heal me uh, I said yes he will uh, and we prayed for her one month later all clear all clear all clear still rejoicing still rejoicing she later told me, she said, the doctors can't find the tumors. Don't you know God is good at hide and seek? If he could hide the body of Moses so that Satan couldn't find it, if he can take your sins and bury them in the depths of the sea, don't you think that same God can take away your sickness, take away your pain, take away your misery, and do it for you? Come on, folks, we got precedent. We have precedent. If he did it back then, I can call him Jehovah Rapha today. He multiplied five loaves, two fishes, put gold in fish's mouth, multiplied a catch of fishes. Uh, if he did it back then, I can call him Jehovah Jireh today. Uh, he walked on water then. He defied nature then. He's not relocated to the past. So I can call him Jehovah Shema, the ever-present help in the time. He's not the I was. He He's the I am. He's not the God of the past. He's the God of the moment. He's the God of now. He's the God of this day. saying if he did it in AD 30, he can do it in AD 2021. We've got precedent. I, lo I love this. I love this. 
I'm trying to feed some faith in this building right now. Can I do that? I need to feed the faith. Some of you have been listening to that devil's roar. You need to hear the line of tribe of Judah roar a little bit. Uh, you need to hear Jesus roar. It was Lloyd John Ogilvy? He was a chaplain in the United States Senate some years back. He wrote a commentary, and I do recommend this commentary on the book of Acts. It'll light up your mind. It's called The Bush is Still Burning. Ogilvy was Presbyterian. But it was him who said, we have fragmented the oneness of God. We've got to realize that God who created this world, God who appeared to Moses by fire, is the same God who robed himself in flesh. And the Holy Ghost is nothing more than Jesus Christ in the present tense on the inside. It's a powerful, it's powerful, folks. He, he looks at this. He calls it the bush is still burning. And he looks at the I am statements of Jesus that go back to that I am that I am revealed to Moses. He's a Hebrew scholar. And Ogilvy said it like this. If you were to translate that literally, it's not I am that I am in the sense of a static being. He said it translates, I am the God who makes things happen. So when he says, I am bread, he's really saying, I'm the God that makes bread happen. And when he said healing, I am Jehovah Rapha, I am healer, I am the God who makes healing happen. I am hope, I am peace, I am joy, I am rest. I am your comfort, relief from your stress. I am strength. I am faith. I am love. I am power. I am your freedom. This very hour, when you call on me, the great I am, you're calling on the one who makes things uh, happen. Uh, I like what A.W. Tozer said. Anything God has ever done, he can do now. Anything God has ever done anywhere, he can do here. Anything God has ever done for anyone, he can do for you and you and you and you and you and you. And you and you and you, we have precedent. Kotala mashanda mahata maha. So I say with Habakkuk, repeat them in our day. But even though we have precedent, we need to embrace the unprecedented. Yeah. Yeah. Since our hope is in God, the one who makes things happen, you got to understand God, something about God. He's constantly outdoing himself. Yeah, that differs from man in a scientific sense. It's the second law of thermodynamics, entropy, things degrade, things go from bad to worse. That may be true in the natural realm, but God gets richer as the days go by. In the musical sense, there's a diminuendo, a diminishing, and a crescendo, a heightening. God is into crescendos. In the prophetic sense, this is the modus operandi of God. This is the divine motif sent in his, seen in his very first miracle at Cana of Galilee that he saves the best for last, unprecedented. It's never been heard of before. But here's what we believe, church, that the latter is going to be greater than the former. That the latter rain is going to be greater than the former rain. The latter house, hey, Calvary, the latter house uh, will be greater than the former house. Uh, the latter you will be better than the former you. And greater works uh, than these shall you do. Uh, you've not seen your greatest miracle. You You've not heard uh, the greatest message. Uh, you've not witnessed uh, the most explosive revival in this church. Uh, but you shall. You shall. Uh, because God uh, is outdoing himself. Uh, and he's saving the best for last. In my office, I have some audio recordings of the last survivors of Azusa. They had largely been children at the Azusa Street Revival. Yeah. Yeah. As that 1,000-day revival drew to a close, a prophecy was given. And these kids that were interviewed when they were in their 80s remembered the prophecy. They said, William Seymour, William Seymour, that pastor of Azusa Street, gave a prophecy. And that same prophecy would be shared 
by other people in three other locales. Listen to this. William Seymour in Los Angeles said a century from now, there is a coming and outpouring of the Spirit in greater measure than what we've seen at Azusa Street. In Chicago, Mariah Woodworth Etter, who preached that famous camp meeting in Arroyo Seco, she was standing in the historic Stone Church at the same time. She stopped preaching, stepped back, shook, and began to tremble and said, God just told me in 100 years there is coming a latter rain that will exceed anything we have seen in our day. On the East Coast, this was just revealed by his granddaughter not long ago. Charles Parham was preaching in New York, and uh, when suddenly he too stopped preaching and said, I see a revival coming in 100 years that will sweep this continent. On the Gulf Coast, Harvey Scher took it a step further. While at Opperman's Bible School, the School of the Prophets in Houston, he had a vision of the throne room, and he saw angels hustling about. And one in particular was writing feverishly, and suddenly the angel dropped the pen and picked up many ornately wrapped packages. And Cher said, all of a sudden, I was back in Houston looking up at the night sky, and I saw that same angel coming down out of heaven with gift dropping from his arms all over the United States. I saw hordes of demons begin to flee, and I saw a revival breaking out all over the United States. Uh, and he said, the Holy Ghost told me that will be 100 years from now. Folks, I don't believe it's coming. I believe it's here. I believe it's all around us. Uh, I believe we're seeing it without perhaps knowing what we're seeing. Uh, but don't you doubt the events of last year uh, have been uh, for a divine uh, awakening. Uh, while the world is choosing an awakening, uh, we are choosing uh, an awakening. And we are going to see the outpouring of God in a mighty way. And we're going to see it happen. Satan, you can't counterfeit what God has planned for this day. We've got a good God that is outdoing himself. Woo, praise God. I told that story, that last story about Harvest Sherry. I told that story about the gifts, gifts uh, dropping from heaven. And I was in a meeting not long ago when all of a sudden somebody began to wail in the Holy Ghost. Uh, and I, I looked at the pastor and said, what's happening? This is unique, uh, what I'm sensing. He said, last night that man had a dream. He had a dream. He was walking through a field and he saw light come out of a gigantic barn. Uh, and as he got to the barn, the closer he got, shafts of light coming through the board planks. Uh, and suddenly the walls just fell away. And there was a giant an angel standing uh, in the middle of the barn and in his hand was a gift uh, and he was holding it out uh, and the man perceived this is the revival that we've been waiting for for our assembly uh, and he reached out to accept the gift uh, and the dream disappeared. Here's what I believe, Denver. I believe there's an angelic hand uh, and there is a, oh my, there is a gift uh, that is just being extended. Pastor, I believe there's a gift. Pastor, I believe there's a gift uh, that an angel's just got, uh, and he's waiting for someone to say, uh, it's mine, uh, it's mine. Uh, I got to have it. I got to have it in my life. Uh, I want to see it. I got to have it. Well, I feel the Holy Ghost in here right now. <laughs> New York's a long way from Denver, but it's really not that far. It just takes somebody to say, it's mine. It's mine. I was in a camp meeting years ago. I was in a camp meeting in Lufkin, Texas, and I was a I served as a press biter back then. And uh, I was sitting on the platform with all the other press biters, and uh, and Randy Keys was preaching. Brother Keys stopped preaching. He stopped, just stood, stepped back, and said, "Oh, oh, God just told me." Someone in this building is about to see a hundred soul revival. It's quiet until one 
foolish presbyter stood up in his chair who may look something like me and shouted, This is what you've got to do when a promise comes. You've got to take possession of it. Even old carnal Ahab said, Ramoth and Gilead is ours. Why don't we possess it? You've got to take possession. Nobody responded. I sat down. I pretty soon was laying on the floor. I pretty soon just laid there on the floor until the lights were turned off and everybody left. And I got home that Sunday and I told the church about it. And I said, you're a foolish pastor. Did this. When the elder in my church, I'll never forget it. He's the longest serving board member. Sir, in the tan coat, he sits right about where you did. He stood up and said, I agree. Three weekends from then on Friday night, 37 received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Saturday night, 18 got the Holy Ghost. Sunday morning, 41 got the Holy Ghost. Uh, Sunday night, 19 more got the Holy Ghost. Uh, You see, here's the way I believe it. Uh, I believe when God hands you a promise, uh, he's just waiting for somebody uh, to stand up and say, that's mine. That's mine. Uh, It belongs to me. Uh, It belongs Uh, Boy, if I could tell you what my eyes are seeing right now. Oh, oh, they that goeth forth weeping, bearing precious seeds shall doubtless come again rejoicing, bringing their sheaves with them. There is a harvest that's made manifest. It's preceded by tears. It's preceded by crying out to God. I believe it's here. I believe it's all around us. I believe it's happening. I believe God's doing a quick work in this day. I'm almost through. You may be seated, and then this is it. Are you ready? I saw an article not long ago in a British newspaper. I don't read the newspaper. Does anybody read the newspaper anymore? I saw this in an online version of a British newspaper, and it touched my heart. A storm had hit one of the British Isles many years ago. They lost their sandy shores, and it became a desolate shoreline. This is what it looked like, this desolate shoreline, just rocks. An entire generation grew up hearing the elders talk about the sandy shoreline that had once existed. Elders would sit around and tell stories about the way it used to be, but nothing changed that rocky, bleak landscape that the next generation saw until one spring. An unusually strong tide hit the island, and with it came hundreds of thousands of tons of sand such that the next morning the villagers awakened and saw this. And the next generation understood what the elders had been talking about. Boy, I feel the Holy Ghost in this right now. I feel the Holy Ghost in this. I'm weary of hearing about revivals of yesterday. I want to see it happen and to a greater degree uh, today. Uh, When God... Oh, my. When God sees his people began to cry, I believe that each of us has got to say once again, Lord, I'm ready to possess your promises. I'm ready to step out in faith. I love this verse, Isaiah 43, 26. Put me in remembrance. God's saying, remind me. Remind me of my promises to you. All right, God, musicians come. Here we go. I'm going to remind you, God. God, you said I am blessed and I cannot be cursed, Numbers 23. God, you said with long life you would satisfy me. God, you said when the enemy comes at me, you would defeat them and they would flee seven ways. Uh, God, you said your favor is not for a season but for a lifetime. What are you doing, Brother Gurley? I'm reminding him. I'm putting him in remembrance. God, you said you would 
supply all my needs uh, according to your riches and glory. You said you would restore health unto me and heal me of my wounds. Uh, God, you said you will be my vindicator and you will fight my battles. Uh, God, you said I will live uh, and I will not die. Uh, God, you said you will open up the windows of heaven. Uh, God, you said you would give me beauty uh, for my ashes. Uh, I'm putting you, I'm putting you in remembrance, God. Uh, you said you'd pay me back double uh, for my trouble. Uh, God, you said my end uh, would be better than my beginning. Uh, you said no weapon formed against me uh, shall prosper, and you would restore what the enemy has taken from me. I am putting you uh, in remembrance because it's time. It's time. Just stay standing. It was in our text in chapter 1, Habakkuk described that judgment was coming to Judah. Chapter 2, Habakkuk fusses with God about that coming judgment. Chapter 3, Habakkuk starts saying, one more time, God. Once again, Lord, one more time. Let this generation see your awesome power. Before destruction, bring mercy. It's a truism, but true. In advance of a storm, the waves rise. In America's history, just prior to every major war, an awakening has come. Before the Revolutionary War, the Great Awakening. Before the Civil War, the Second Great Awakening. Before the World Wars, the modern Pentecostal Revival. Before the Vietnam War, a second wave of the Pentecostal Revival. Before great physical upheavals, God sends a spiritual upheaval. That's his way. Like what Black, Blackaby said, he has done it before. And my prayer is we are the kind of people through whom he can do it again. Whew. One final awakening, God. One more time, Lord. One more time. One more time before this world begins to melt with the fiery heat. One more time, God. Send revival. Send the prodigals home. Bring back the backsliders, God. Stir this city, God. Shake this city. One more time, God. One more time, Lord. One more time. One more time. One more time, God. One more time. One more time, oh, oh, oh. One more time, God. One more time, Lord. All across this building. Uh, if God is moving on your heart, you find a place to pray uh, and say, I may be the next Jeremiah Lanthier. I may be the next vessel, the next instrument. Uh, I may be the next one used mightily of God. Uh, I agree, Pastor Haman. I agree. I agree with what God is moving in your spirit, Lord. I agree, Pastor. I agree, church leadership. I agree. I agree what I'm sensing. An anointing. An anointing from heaven, O Lord. Oh, sigh. Cry. Lift your voice. Deep calls to deep. Uh, let the groans of the Holy Ghost, uh, let a voice that cannot be uttered, uh, let something grip you. Uh, pray in the Spirit, pray with your understanding. Uh, oh, I claim it right now, God.
to God, saints of God, cry out to God. I believe. I'll see you do it. Let your faith shout louder than the storm. Let your faith shout louder than the other voices. 